Tan Sri Bernard, ladies and gentlemen. I have a story to talk, uh, share with you about what we're doing in Malaysia in terms of economic transformation program. Then I will dwell in much more deeply on, uh, on oil palm and how it connects to uh, the economic transformation program. First of all, when our Prime Minister took office in April 2009, he, the big word that he started to talk with us is about transforming the nation. You know, when you want to transform a country, you cannot begin by doing that until and unless you begin with a united society. And so the first thing he talked about was one Malaysia, that Malaysia, everyone in this country must learn to live together and be united. You know, I'm a fan of Chelsea. We, we became the Champions League. We, we won uh, last year because we became united after we got rid of our coach. You know, some of you are fans of, uh, you know, Tottenham and others, others Manchester City, and, uh, but really, and I cannot imagine how you can become a champion until and unless you become united. That's what the one Malaysia idea. Then we then began by saying, if we are united as a country, in, we have to make sure we grow our economy. That means we grow the economy, the government gets more revenue. When the government gets more revenue, then it gets spent where it matters to the public, hence the government transformation program. That means there's equity in which we will spend our money for the public. The political transformation program consists like things like getting rid of uh, draconian and archaic laws such as the Internal Security Act, making sure that a functional democratic society like ours, that uh, dissent is allowed, constructive dissent is allowed, because that's the bedrock for democracy moving forward. And that's what we're doing in Malaysia, the Peaceful Assembly Act, making sure that donations, political donations are made to political parties rather than to individuals. So those are all things that relate to the political dimensions. I want to talk a bit more about the process now. How did you go about doing this? The first thing we did in the government was we decided we shouldn't use the old trodden method of government developing an economic program. That means sending some clever people into a smoke-filled room and leave them there for a while, government servants, for example, or some consultants to come with solutions. We said that's not the way in which we intend to do it this time. This time round, we make sure that we run laboratories, which is the labs, number two there. That means getting the private sector people in a room together with also the government servants and the ministers in and out, Bernard Tansri Bernard himself came into the lab on uh, oil palm. We have the oil palm players inside the room. For all together, eight weeks, we threw away the key. And if you like music, the, the quote in Hotel California is, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. So you stay there until you sort it out. What did we do with oil and gas? We bought Shell people inside the room. We got, Tesco, oh, we got Shell, we got Exxon, we got Petronas and Caltex, everybody inside the room. What did we do with wholesale and retail? We got Tesco, you got Maidin, we got Cal, uh, you know, Kafu and all. Those guys couldn't stand one another in the room. You know, they quarreled intensely in the beginning. We had for CCI, we had Telco, all together in the room. It was really fascinating. By the way, we got all the private sector people in labs, 500 people during the World Cup time. That was when we started to do this. And they were there for free. They gave eight hours of their time full time inside those labs. And that's where all the problem solving and the analysis was done. Then we ran open days. Whatever we generated inside the labs was then exposed to the public for public consumption and debate. And that's when we conducted it here. 13,000 people came to Kuala Lumpur. We have about 2,500 in Kuching, another 3,000 in KK that visited the open days to then find out what we were doing there, challenging them, refining the ideas, giving input, etc. Then we wrote the book called uh, The Economic Transformation Program. If you want to know more about this detailed work, please come to the Pamandu website. If you're an avid reader, there is the 601 page version for you. If you're lazy, it's okay, we have the 35 page summary. If you're very lazy, that's okay too, we have the six minute video. <laughs> and so you've got no excuse for not knowing the details of what we're doing here. And then we then translated everything into KPI, Key Performance Indicators. Every minister has KPIs associated with them. Tansri Bernard Dompo's KPIs also is published in the book. 
and what he has to deliver and what he is not delivering is also in our annual report, and all other ministers. Every meeting we conduct, he chairs a meeting called the Steering Committee meeting for oil palm. All issues that are facing the industry are being discussed in those steering committee meetings. Things that we cannot resolve at the steering committee meeting are then channeled to the Economic Council meeting which is chaired by the Prime Minister every Monday, 9.30 onwards. 9.30 up to 12. There will be one today. Very, very detailed discussions about what we needed to do going forward. We have an international audit that's being done by international panel, including the guy who used to do my job in Tony Blair's outfit is on the panel. The person who does my job in South Korean government is on the panel, representative from IMF and others. Every year they come here and verify and check our work and give us input. We also have an audit work and validation work of our results that's done by Price Wadahos Coopers. So then we announce our results every year. Last year we, we announced our results under the annual report. What we have delivered, what we've also not, not delivered is in the report. The performance of every minister is published inside that report. And so if you want to know more about the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's in the report. Now let me talk about the content now. That's uh, by and by the process that we're taking. Um, the notion behind One Malaysia and also the Economic Transformation Program and the GTP is to make sure that by the year 2020 we become a developed nation, a high-income nation, that we make sure that all communities in Malaysia benefit from this prosperity and that it is not just for one year, but it goes on for future generations, the sustainability component. Some of you are good at mathematics. You remember the John Venn diagram, the intersection of this John Venn diagram in the middle is quality of life. Now, we looked at many countries. Many countries have moved from low income to middle income and they get stuck there. They don't move to high income. Very few countries successfully made it to high income nations. We then examine what separates those that make it against those that have failed. We found two things. The first one is about focus. Since we've just finished the uh, Olympics, can you imagine if Usain Bolt wanted to be the champion in 100 meters, but he also wanted to be marathon champion. He also wants to be the swimming champion. He also wants to be javelin uh, champion and short putt champion. And if he did all those events, he wouldn't be a champion. So the key point is all nations that succeed in making it, they have to pick their areas of focus. You cannot want to be good in everything. And so many countries, when you move from low income to middle income, it's okay to do everything because you're starting at a very low base. When you are middle income, to succeed, you really need to choose your areas of focus. And that's one of the lessons that we have now picked in and imbued in the economic transformation program. Now, returning back to the same story about Usain Bolt, even if you're totally focused, but if you are not competitive, you're not good enough. And so we have to create the conditions for competitiveness to flourish in Malaysia. There are strategic reform initiatives that we are implementing, 51 of them, a lot of them that we are now implementing to cause the conditions for competitiveness to flourish in Malaysia so that companies operating in Malaysia, foreign companies as well as local companies, they become competitive so that their products and services will win it out there in the international market. This is a summary of what is in the economic transformation program. True North for us is about increasing our gross national income so that it meets the minimum 15,000 US dollars per capita established by the World Bank. We have to increase our total gross national income to reach 1.7 trillion uh, um, yeah, ringgit, which is about five to three billion uh, trillion uh, in the US dollars. We need to create a lot of jobs because if you don't create jobs, you cannot share the prosperity to the citizens. So the total incremental jobs we have to create is 3.3 million jobs. But if you want to get there, you cannot get there without investments. So it's very important that we have to create conditions for investors to come and put money in our country. And we decided that it is not the government that throws much of that money in terms of investment is the private sector that needed to do it. So 92% of the investments required to propel the economy 
towards high income between now and the year 2020 needs to come from the private sector. I know the Chinese don't like the number four, 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 four. So I've asked my team, can you convert that into ringgit so that we just remove the four? It's still there, one for four trillion. I'm not a suspicious person, so it's okay, superstitious. So nonetheless, when you start looking at the numbers there, the key point here is that the bulk of the investments that is coming to propel the economy to high income is mainly from uh, the private sector. And also, a large chunk of that is also domestic. You can see the numbers. Domestic investment is 73%. The transformational action, uh, actions are into two buckets. The ones that are helping us to focus on those sectors, and oil palm is one of them. And to be competitiveness, uh, to be competitive. Those are the, 100, the 51 policy reforms. I just want to quickly cover what are those strategic reform initiatives that we're doing. An example, for the first time in the history of Malaysia, we've in, in, introduced and enforced a competition act. That means there's no price rigging, no price fixing, etc. Why did we do this? Because we wanted to create the conditions for competitiveness to flourish in Malaysia. Level playing field. That's key for us to do this. Another example, liberalizing subsectors. These are sectors that the Prime Minister has announced when local companies are mature enough to withstand competition, we liberalize it so that there is no restrictions on equity. Foreign uh, participation can come and invest into Malaysia and be allowed to operate uh, freely. And those are the sectors already liberalized as 12, and the remaining are coming through. Next. We also look at standards that exist in Malaysia, something like 6,000 standards exist in all sectors, but we discovered that only 10% of them are actually enforced and followed through. And so we're encouraging a lot more companies in Malaysia to follow best practice standards. You cannot compete in the international arena until you have the best practice standards. And so that is one of the things that we're really running through uh, in the program. Now, we looked at the sectors. We have more or less 40 different sub-sectors, et cetera. And when we looked at them, we saw the areas that we had to focus on. There were 12 that were chosen. One of them is uh, geography, which is greater KL, because cities compete much more vigorously than nations, and the rest are economic sectors. And oil palm is a very big one. So when we had the oil palm, we, we ran the labs. We got a lot of people that were in the room. We, we asked them to analyze everything that was, what do we needed to do going forward? The first thing that stuck out like a sore thumb was this chart. There are a lot of our trees Nearly 400,000 hectares with trees older than 25 years old. So we've got to deal with this. It's a massive issue around replanting, making sure that we replant so that this is sustainability. You remember the point I made about sustainability. You cannot just think about today's business without taking tomorrow. Next. We also looked at the uh, composition of the industry, the upstream versus the downstream. The bulk of the work that we do here 81.7% of the export value is in the upstream component. A very small component is in the downstream se sector. Those are very important, big factors that we have to consider going forward. So when we looked at what we were doing to make the transformation, we were quite clear. We don't sit out here and say, oh, let's solve the, the world's problem in just one-time solution. We don't do that. We started with the notion of entry point projects. What are the projects that we will begin as we open the door of transformation? But it doesn't mean that we're the only projects. As you start walking in year in and year out, subsequent years, you will add more projects. These were the eight ones that were chosen in the lab, which were catalytic to move the pieces forward. The word is catalytic. There were eight of them that were related to the upstream productivity and sustainability. And there were three that were really to propel the growth of the downstream sector. And that was the way we saw it. In terms of uh, contribution, the gross national income contribution is 47 billion uh, ringgit of gross national income for Malaysia by the year 2020. That's an annual number. It's not a cumulative number. Uh, 134,000 jobs will be created by this. It will benefit something like 161,000 smallholders. Let me just give some example. I made reference to the fact that we have to 
really need to accelerate the replanting and also planting new. So this is a massive effort. Tan Sri Bernard together with the KSU and everyone, we are really keeping an eye on this program. And last year alone, we planted 103,000 hectares replanted, despite high CPO prices. It was very important that we need to think about the future while we are also looking at the present. It is absolutely key, and this is one of the most important things that we saw a byproduct of the lab that we need to have a very aggressive way moving forward in, in doing this. Government is giving a lot of incentives and grants to allow this to happen. Second one is about increasing the fresh fruit buns in terms of the yield. There were four activities and we recruited something like 400 TUNAS officers we will, which we put out there on the mills to, uh, to check that things are done properly, asking mandating rather that the reference industry best practices are employed within the sectors. MPOB have got some very nice documents about best practices, but not all the, pe not all the players actually follow those best practices. Again, I referred to the standards earlier on, the 6,000. This is exactly one example, making sure that people follow the standards that are written down. If you follow the standard, you can increase your yield, etc. Second one is improving workers' productivity. Malaysia invented the tool, Chantas, as you know. It's a very simple sickle at the top and a very long pole and motor at the bottom. And when we first started, MPOB uh, had this. It, it cost about 5,000 ringgit per unit. And it was too expensive for the smallholders. So there was an attempt to reduce that cost. It was brought down to 2,500. And it was still considered difficult for many of them to afford. And so the government decided to subsidize 1,000 ringgit so that it costs only in the hands of the smallholders uh, 1,500. It was still difficult. Essentially, our analysis suggested that if you have two workers today, if you use the tool there, you can have only one. So you can cut down the manpower. You can recover the cost within maybe nine months uh, if you start to use this properly. But it's very difficult. And so this is one of the things. So the uptake is now improving. And so 50% overall improvement in productivity. So continuously figuring out ways in which we can get more and more people to automate and use the tool. Um, I, see, I covered this already. Improving the oil extraction rate. This is a very important thing that needed to be done so that we get as much oil out from the FFBs. And so it is very important that you, we find best practices that people segregate all the, the best ones that are sent to the mills and that you get the best out from them. And so the segregation is important. Putting enforcement officers at the mills, as we saw, was a very big thing that helped to do this. Next. You can see the black line is the, the EOR rates. You can see it is much better than in previous years. It was gradual decline, but you can see a big improvement in EOR. Small marginal improvement is billions of ringgit, actually. Next. We also, under EPP5, we develop biogas facilities and mills. They're on track 221 mills that are either in a planning stage or under construction that are doing this to promote the trapping of methane gas to reduce a greenhouse uh, gas emissions for their own usage or to supply to the grid. This is one of the things that is being used. Quite ancillary to this, we have introduced what's called a feed-in tariff. The feed-in tariff uh, is, is, is essentially a, a, a subsidy that we grant for renewable energy. So if you produce renewable energy, either from solar or from this, you send it to the grid, we will give you a premium for it. But that premium, there was a sliding scale for degression. That means it's like opium. If you give subsidy, people get addicted to it. But you must tell them within eight years or so that opium will become zero. And so people then make this, and so we give it under the feed-in tariff. It's going really well. So we, we have a huge uptake on it. In fact, within six months since we announced the feed-in tariff, I think it was all taken. And so we feel very encouraged by this. Uh, focus on high-value oleo derivatives. Uh, again, I made reference to the fact that uh, the lion's share of our export value is in the upstream business. We want to increase the downstream component. So we're encouraging both local companies and foreign companies to set up uh, factories or businesses that will produce high-value oleo derivatives. And so seven business proposals worth 1.35 billion 
uh, ringgit of investment are already on the ground. That is good for us. Also, under EPP7, commercialized the second generation of biofuel. The early first generation of biofuel, we had learned a lot uh, about them. We saw that there are now better and much uh, more avant-garde or new technologies that are available. Premium renewable energy is first plan is out in Felda Sahabat in, 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 in Sabah. And so we continue, continually ask the private sector to, uh, to put in uh, new technologies uh, so that we can get much better value out from oil palm in this, this regard. Exploiting growth in food and health-based segment. Tansri Bernard referred to this before. There's a lot of people that say negative things about the oil palm products, and our views are there is a lot of positive benefits that are we seeing in it. And there are we we've given the government 10 R&D grants for clinical trials on palm phytonutrients. Very positive results so far. We also have two business proposals approved to date on Toko Trinol. There are a lot of very, very positive results that are coming out from it, too many to mention. I'm sure they will talk to some of our experts in this area uh, during the course of the conference. They'll tell you more about this. Um, some money, whatever we ask for, in, in, has been granted by the Prime Minister in the last budget for the 2013. We have 432.8 million ringgit of uh, grants that is allowed by the given by the government for replanting for new planting grants 7500 for peninsula malaysia for, per hectare 9000 for uh, sabah and sarawak because the cost is higher out there plus a subsistence allowance we also have allocation for the oleo derivatives up to 40 percent of the capital expenditure in the downstream and also allocation of grants for food and health-based segments, some, some of the examples of things we're doing. Nonetheless, uh, we look at the market continuously and we have to respond to what's happening in the market. Tansri Bernard has already uh, announced some of the measures that we're doing today uh, to do this. Decision made in the cabinet, CPO duty-free export quota discontinued as of, uh, that was discontinued as January. We're giving lead time for them to exhaust what quota is uh, currently available lower CPO export tax that is given out there. This is a dynamic export tax structure, very dynamic. That means it will allow the upstream to grow as well as the downstream to grow that one does not die for the sake of the other. And so therefore, we matching what is uh, happening in Indonesia, uh, almost toe to toe in this, re in this regard to make sure that we do, not, we do not discourage that upstream, we need both because if you are a player like Malaysia, we need to grow the upstream and the downstream in, in, in tandem. So that the dynamism that we introduce inside the export structure will allow this uh, to happen. So what's happening on the economy? We've done all this stuff. By the way, I'm just giving an example of what we're doing on the oil palm, but same story for others, all the other 12 sectors. The good news today is we're beginning to see some good signs. We peg against the 1.7 trillion GNI by the year 2020, the annual number we beat the target last year. We were supposed to achieve 797 billion uh, ringgit of gross national income. We surpassed that with 830 billion, that's 4% ahead of the target. Last year, the private investment target, remember the 1.4 uh, trillion that I referred to, the 444 US dollars, the annual target was 83, 83 86. We surpassed that last year. We achieved actually 94 billion. That means 9% ahead of that target. Tall as it was, we met them. But we didn't quite meet the job targets. We were supposed to create 330,000 jobs. We achieved 95% of that. That is uh, uh, 313,000 jobs. So, but we feel very encouraged so far. The results are beginning to show. Against the set KPIs, we were 23% ahead of the targets last year all in all, taking into consideration. Up to August this year, we already 69% of the target. So we feel very encouraged by this so far. These are the international panel that I referred to. They come here for two days. They gustapo us and do I, almost like Putrajaya Inquisition, checking everything we do and seeing that, that we are on track as we promised. Some of the comments they gave was the, you know, the approach that we're using for transformation in Malaysia is highly innovative, exciting, high impact, speedy, 
and they, they're saying that it's gaining global recognition. So we had 14 countries that came to Malaysia to learn from our process uh, the last uh, six months or so. And so a few of other countries are expressed interest also to, uh, to learn. Uh, these are the numbers for this year, January up to now. For first half, phenomenal increase in private investment. Private investment grew the first half of this year by 28.1%. In fact, uh, Dato Mustafa, who is the minister in charge of trade and also investments, he said in his time, ever since he joined the government, this is the highest increase he's ever seen. 28.1% increase in private investment. Public investment also grew by 24.3%. So we really are very happy with the investment. Why is it, putting investment is very important is this. Because investment is the leading indicator, leading indicator for growth. If there are no investments, you have no projects. No projects, no GNI increments, no new jobs. So it's very important that we, we win it out there. So there are more coming. So those are realized investment. They are in the pipeline, something like 205 uh, billion ringgit of pipeline committed investment by the private sector, such as the biggest investments that uh, Malaysia has ever seen as a single project is in Pangarang, down south in Johor. And that is a uh, 60 billion ringgit of investment. Shell is putting 35 billion ringgit in enhanced oil and recovery, the highest investments in EOR in all 100 countries that they're putting it here in Malaysia. It only tells you one thing, that people are beginning to see this is a good place to invest. Lots of new jobs are coming. <clears throat> Market cap. Because all of this is happening, if you look at what happened to the market cap in the stock market in Malaysia, in August 2010, it stood at 1.12 trillion. It has moved to 1.43 trillion. It's 25% increase in the market cap. That means if everyone who held their shares in August 2010 sold their shares in September, uh, then they would have been richer by 280 billion ringgit. That's a lot of money, actually. That's a massive increase in the, the, the market cap. So you can see we have reached an historic high on the 4th of September, 1,600 uh, points on the FTSE Bursa KLC Index. Malaysia is doing this by helping to make sure that we are on the path to reduce our fiscal deficit. When the Prime Minister took office in 2009, our fiscal deficit stood at 6.6% of GDP. We brought that down in 2010 to 5.6% of GDP. We brought it further down in 2011 to 4.8%. We hope to this year, by the time we close our books this year, to bring it down to 45 at the budget that the Prime Minister just announced for next year, our target is to bring it further down to 4%. By the year 2015, we want to bring it to lower than 3%. By the year 2020, we should be neutral. And so this is the way we want to make sure that we run the economy. We put the investment, not investing in places that do not generate the GNI, investing them in the, G, in the economic sectors that will give us the GNI, because that will give more government revenue. If you get more government revenue, then you can have a much more balanced and proper budget. So, of course, today it is possible to have immediately a surplus uh, budget. That means no need to invest. If we want to do it, you could do it, actually. Just have zero investment. No, no DE, de development expenditure, because at the operating level, we are already surplus. So, but that's not the way forward. We need to grow the economy. So we are growing the economy by investing in sectors that will help us to generate more. These are some record-breaking statistics that I want to mention. Last year, we have our record GNI, the highest in our history, record GDP, record IPO, the single largest IPO value that's under Felder Global Ventures, actually. The interesting point is oil palm in Malaysia is actually out there on the world map in terms of IPO, that's the largest. Record private consumption. This year alone, from beginning of the year until June this year, our consumption grew by 8% this year. Why is private uh, consumption important, domestic consumption? Because it forms 69% of our GDP. So it's very, very important. And so record government revenue, this is the highest revenue we've ever achieved uh, in Malaysia, what, 185.4 billion ringgit last year. And that's why we could do things like BRIM and to help 
uh, reduce this money that we grant to the poor people whose incomes are low, lower than uh, 3,000 ringgit per month. So we give cash to help them uh, deal with the rising cost of living. The highest private investment in 10 years was last year, 111.8 billion. The highest foreign direct investment numbers in 10 years was also last year. In fact, the rebase numbers, total trade was the highest in our history, 1.47 trillion. Uh, so that's also very, very good. In fact, the data that I have today showed that last year's export for oil palm was the highest in four years because I didn't have the data beyond four years. I suspect if we did have the data, my guess is that, in fact, 80.4 billion total export trade last year was the highest in our, our history, my guess. But I stand to be corrected. The data I saw this morning was only a four-year data, but it was already the highest. It tells me the story like this, that when you start to transform an economy, you begin with catalytic entry point projects. Those are the things that you begin to intervene. Knowing that the interventions that you make there will catalyze the rest of the economy in a way that will cause multiplier effect. The vicious circle will begin to spin because we are also creating the reform conditions, what we call the strategic reform initiatives on the ground, like the competition law, enforcing the standards. And this is the same story if I stood here to tell you the story about rubber, we could talk about that too. I could tell you a story about oil and gas in the same manner, wholesale and retail, tourism, the same story, the same template. We're running this thing to all of the 12 NKAs. The collective results of this is showing in all these records record investment, record investment, record trade, and actually I'm beginning to feel that as we keep focusing our minds in doing this, we will get there. For oil palm, for me, it's a very important point. It's an industry that is a very, very important contributor to the world economy, actually, when you start thinking about it. The statistics that Bernard mentioned earlier on, suggesting that 52% was 50 over percent of the fatty oils in the world is actually coming from oil palm. And so we do contribute to this. We're going to deal with issues around negative publicity associated with, with the oil palm industry. But we also need to be mindful of today's business, fixing the price, and at the same time thinking about the future in terms of sustainability, hence the replanting that's needed for us. Automation is key. Making sure there's a balance between upstream and downstream is also very important so that not all the, the value is just left in the upstream sector, but also the downstream sector. So you can hopefully, when you start beginning to see this, and plus the effort that we're doing to push the players to follow best practice standards so that you get as much productivity and yield out from the existing uh, crops that we have today. And I believe that Malaysia is on a crossroad to making a radical improvement in our results. And so even the short-term measures that Tan Sri Bernard had announced on Friday showed that we are responding to current uh, domestic issues, current international pricing issues, and at the same time looking at the more uh, long-term and the medium-term measures as well. So thank you.